All right. Well, we at last come to Jonathan Edwards. I am not going to bore you um, with the extent to which uh, I am indebted to this man. But as I have said, out of all the men in church history outside of the Bible, uh, I just happen to be more of a fan of Jonathan Edwards. I think uh, he's probably just, some of it is just more, he's more relatable. You know, he is American. I mean, a colonial America, but still American. So I think by God's providence, we're, you know, uh, Independence Day Eve, we are discussing, in my opinion, the greatest American ever. So, you know, I can relate to him with that. He married a Sarah, so did I, and she was wonderful, and mine is fantastic, and she's a godly woman, love her to death. And so, you know, whereas Augustine never married, Thomas Aquinas never married, Martin Luther married much later, um, and I've told you, you know, some of the some of the characteristics. You know, I wouldn't want to reflect as much as Luther did. Uh, John Calvin was a great man, um, but jo Jonathan Edwards, I just think, sticks out. Um, as I mentioned in our series regarding uh, or our session regarding free will last week, Encyclopedia Britannica says Jonathan Edwards is the greatest American philosopher ever. And again, they didn't say theologian, although he was the greatest theologian of all of American history. Okay, He was also something of a scientist, which we'll see. So I'm very excited to discuss Jonathan Edwards. However, since y'all are forcing me to do in doing this in only two sessions where, you know, I have to make this kind of more compact than I'd like um, and pray to God that we will consider him in a more expansive form um, at some later date. Okay, so he was born on October the 5th, 1703 in East Windsor, Connecticut. It's modern day South Windsor. East Windsor, Connecticut. This was during like the frontier times, okay? So where he grew up was kind of not necessarily the wild, but compared to like New York City even at that time, so to speak, it was um, less, far less settled, I'll put it that way. Um, and then he goes into an even um, greater wilderness, so to speak, um, which later on, but uh, which we will discuss next week, God willing. So again, born October the 5th, 1703 to Timothy Edwards, who was a Puritan minister at the Church of um, East Windsor for 64 years. So Jonathan Edwards and his father, Richard, also was a preacher. And so Jonathan Edwards grew up a student of the church. And his father, his father was a wonderful preacher. And God willing, anyway, we will get to that in due time. And also his mother, Esther Edwards. Esther Edwards was the daughter of Solomon Stoddard. Solomon Stoddard was a great congregational minister in Northampton at the time, and he was a minister there for 55 years. He was called the Pope of the Connecticut River Valley. In the surrounding areas and so forth, he was... He, he was a big figure. He was a major figure. Everybody knew him. In fact, he was so f famous and so well-known and so well-respected that they built a road for him to go between Northampton and Boston because he was a graduate of Harvard and they would go to the commencement speeches in Harvard, which we'll get to eventually. But she, Esther Edwards, was very well-educated for, for a woman at that time. You know, our time is much different praise God, but in that time, women typically wouldn't get an education, okay? So, Timothy and Esther Edwards were his parents. He was the fifth of 11 children. They had 11 children. Didn't quite make it to the 12, unfortunately. But they, they had 11 children. He was the fifth. All 10 of his siblings were sisters, you know, I grew up with four sisters and no disparaging, you know, sisters or so forth. But when you're the only guy, I mean, I did have a brother, but four sisters, I thought, I thought I was, you know, unjustly tormented, you know, with this poor man. Um, but, the, and they were almost six feet tall. So they're around six feet tall. So Timothy Edwards would refer to them as his 60 feet of daughters kind of a thing. And uh, anyway, and 
they actually all they actually helped Jonathan with his studies. They would kind of tutor him. His older sisters would tutor him. In fact, for a few weeks, um, Timothy Edwards served as chaplain to in the French and Indian War, or actually leading up into the French and Indian War or the Seven Years' War. Um, and during that time, he would write letters back home. Reading these letters are fantastic, but anyway, he would write, he wrote back home, um, really encouraging the children to continue their studying, and especially in Latin. And then he wrote another letter about four days later, <laughs> encouraging Jonathan to continue reciting the Latin to his sisters to learn Latin and so forth. So now later on, now, later on, Esther, uh, one of his sisters, at this time. The daughters are also married after their mothers as well. So we have a mother, Esther. We have a daughter, Esther. Sarah and, and Jonathan do the same thing. We have a Sarah Edwards as the mother and a Sarah as a daughter. Makes things kind of more difficult. But anyway, Esther wrote, it turns out anyway, it was Esther who wrote a, an essay on the, on the soul, okay? On the immaterial, uh, immateriality of the soul because somebody had published an essay regarding that really we don't really have a soul. The soul is just physical. He was a philosophical materialist. And she wrote a very satirical response to this, but for the most, most of history, you know, since that time anyway, people assumed it was Jonathan Edwards, and lo and behold, it was actually his sister. Brilliant, brilliant essay. So, Timothy and Esther made sure that even the daughters were very well educated. They prepared, they prepped them for finishing school and all of his sisters were sent to Harvard. They were sent to Boston. Okay. Now, Jonathan, around this time, Timothy Edwards was a graduate of Harvard. Okay. Now, when it was time for Jonathan to go to finishing school at the age of 13, you're so you know, and this was a time where you had to be fluent in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. But anyway, the, the Harvard was, he was a bit disillusioned because what was going on in Harvard is what they referred to as latitudinarianism. Okay, that's a huge word. But ultimately, what they were saying is that they were giving latitude as to how much you have to follow the Westminster Confession of Faith. Okay, and... So ultimately, they were already getting a little bit too liberal for Timothy. Let's just put it that way. So he sent him off to this upstart school, which was founded in 1701. At the time he was sent, it was called the, the um, Collegiate School of Connecticut. It would later be renamed in 1718 Yale uh, from one of the founders, Elisha uh, Yale. is named after him. So he went to Yale at the age of 13. While he was there, and a year later, he actually came across uh, John Locke's on the understand, uh, understanding uh, of the human mind, which very much influenced Jonathan Edwards. I have it if you're interested in, in it. Um, he would use it um, somewhat in his treatise on free will, but also he would kind of criticize it. At, but this was at a much later date. So long after he's much more matured in the faith and intellectually. So... Also, though, at his time at school, he le he kept about four he kept four different kind of notebooks. Okay, one was called the mind, and he would just make notes on the mind at a very young age. And I've read it; it's brilliant. Uh, another one wasn't titled, but it was on the natural sciences. Another one was notes on the scriptures, and another one was miscellanies, just random notes. The last two he would continue throughout his life. Okay. And we don't have time to get into this, but he actually later on kind of made them all into, com into a compendium to just to kind of for work about natural grace, essentially how God works in and through nature. While he was 18, when he turned 18 years old, he actually published an essay for the Royal Science Society in England. And he wrote it, he entitled it, The Flying Spider. Uh, he, he noticed, he recognized this specific kind of spider that would, that would seemingly fly through the air. And he wanted to find out how this was so. 
He was very much intrigued with science. This was time with Newton. You know, all of these things are kind of coming out and brand new, and he's loving it. <laughs> he loves it. So he he does. You know, he notices and he and he studies this spider. He he gets this. I don't know how to, what to call it, but like folio paper. That's what they used. But to kind of put in the back of the spider to see what was going on. And he noticed that you know they would they would fling a web and then kind of jump from that from that web and fling kind of this liquidy uh, web to where the zephyr, the wind blew it to the next tree and then it would kind of do this again and kind of just, and but it looked like it was flying. So I think Stan Lee stole Spider-Man from Jonathan Edwards, just for the record. I think he was the <laughs> progenitor <laughs> of, of Spider-Man. Of Spider but 200 years later, this was well received once people started actually studying the spiders. And this spider is now called the balloon spider. Um, and because not all spiders are like that. Not all spiders fly around. You know, they're just wet down and so forth. And uh, he was very much intrigued with this. He loved... So, Jonathan Edwards was of the stock of the Puritans. Okay. Puritans get a bad rap. I think it was Mencken who said um, Pur a Puritan is someone who fears or just might be someone somewhere having fun, <laughs> you know, they get a bad rap. They're doom and gloom and so forth. And that, that, that's just a mischaracterization of Puritanism. Uh, they were referred to as people of the book. So dedicated they were to the Bible, but also, but actually they were people of two books, the book, the, the word of God, but also the book of nature, the book of nature. Jonathan Edwards probably would have been a scientist had he not become a minister. However, at a time where all of these scientific discoveries are more leaning to skepticism or deism, which is why many of our founding fathers were deists, not Christians, but many of these are, are leaning to skepticism and, and deism, Jonathan Edwards saw that throughout, this is giving us like the formula. We're, we're understanding the nature of God and the glory of God more now. We are just expanding our knowledge of what God does in nature. This doesn't explain away God and so forth. This magnifies God. So anyway, after, after he graduated, he, got, he graduated in 1722, uh, 1722 with a master's in divinity as valedictorian. Okay, Right around this time, he was called to be something of a supply pastor at the First Presbyterian Church in New York. There was a, it was kind of a splinter group. There was a church there, but the church had kind of divided and splintered off, and they asked Edwards to kind of fill in. And as an unordained supply pastor, which he did for a period of eight months, then he encouraged them to reunite with the church, which basically left him out of the gate. I mean, they did ask him to, to remain and, you know, where he would be, be ordained, but he refused, ultimately saying, no, y'all need to reunite this, this division. There's no reason for this division. You know, there are certain causes, uh, but this isn't one of them. Okay. Now, so again, he graduated in 1722. In around, around 1721, according to him, he had what he calls his actual conversion, his actual conversion. And we know this because who would later become his son-in-law, Aaron Burr, and they had a child and named him Aaron Burr Jr., who would be the third vice president of the United States. Anyway, Aaron Burr, while he was attending Yale, sent uh, a letter to Jonathan Edwards asking for his story of his conversion. It might help us out here. You know, this is around 1734, while um, Jonathan Edwards is a minister, but I just wanted to kind of discuss his conversion experience with you and then move on from there. So he wrote back, and this is what's referred to as his personal narrative. Now, I'm going to give you the shorter uh, titles for these books. Back then, they were long titles. So we've kind of condensed them into shorter titles. So this is his personal narrative. In it, he wrote, From my childhood up, my mind had been wont to be full of objections against the doctrine of God's sovereignty in choosing whom he would to eternal life and rejecting whom he pleases, leaving them eternally, eternally to perish and 
and be everlastingly tormented in hell. It used to appear like a horrible doctrine to me. So he grew up in a Christian household, in a Christian household, and he still had objections to God until this time. And he, one of these objections is, you know, I refuse to believe in this election, this doctrine of election, you know, that God chooses whom he pleases and whom he wills, he condemns. He, he thought this was outlandish, entirely unjust until, until his experience. So he, he, wrote of, he wrote about personal as well as doctrinal issues with this until this period. He then continues and refers to what he calls a delightful conviction, a sweet delight in God and divine things. In fact, he went on to say, the appearance of everything was altered. There seemed to be, as it were, a calm, sweet cast or appearance of divine glory in almost everything. God's excellency, his wisdom, his purity and love seemed to appear in everything, in the sun, moon, and stars, in the clouds and blue sky, in the grass, flowers, trees, in the water, and all nature, which used greatly to fix my mind. He goes on to say, I spent much time in viewing the clouds and sky to behold the sweet glory of God in these things. In the meantime, singing forth with a low, low voice contemplations of the Creator and Redeemer. So, now what likely influenced some of this was his scientific studies and his theolo theological studies. You know, he, again, he's recognizing God's glory in nature, and that's what he's emphasizing here. He talks about the doctrinal issue being crushed, and then he takes sweet delight in the fact that he is a child of God, not because of anything he's done. This is why we truly can have assurance. I, I would be scared to death if my salvation even had a 1% effect because of me. I would have no assurance from that. My only assurance is that my name was written on God's heart in eternity. And this is a great comfort to the Christian soul. So, so again, now from uh, 1722 to 1724, he was three of um, he was one of three acting acting rectors. They called them tutors at at uh, Yale when um, uh, when Timothy Cutler, the previous rector, defected to the Anglican Church. And this is one of those times where I wish I could go into more detail, but we have to condense this. And so he was for about two years one of the tutors there. And it looked like he was going to, you know, just live a life in academics, be an academ academician, but he wouldn't make much, in this time, he wouldn't make much money that way, okay? Now, in 1727, on February 15th, 1727, he was called to be an ordained minister at his grandfather's church, at his grandfather, Solomon Stoddard's Congregational Church in Northampton. And this is ultimately what you would do. I didn't want to go into it, but basically when, you know, your pastor's close to the end, you know, you try to give about a six or seven year window and bring somebody in who can gain experience and so forth. And then, you know, over time you, you would, you know, give them more of the responsibilities, more of the duties until, you know, finally you either you know, retire or, or you pass. Um, Solomon Stoddard forgot about that plan and he died two years later. Um, and so Jonathan Edwards became the minister at, of the second largest congregation uh, in the colonies at that time at the age of 26 years old. Now, so in 1727, that's when he was ordained as the associate pastor, if you want to call it that, at uh, Northampton. The same year, he married Sarah Pierpont. She was the daughter of James Pierpont. He was another founder of Yale. Now, when she was 13, he, he, he had this book in, in just it, like right in the margins, he wrote an apostrophe of this girl at 13 years old, he's, 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 he, he says this, I'm gonna give you somewhat of a condensed version, but this is so I don't go off about Sarah Edwards. I think Sarah Edwards is one of the finest Christian women in, in, her, in our history. 
but and God willing, we can have a session to speak about her. But I think for any woman out there, for any Christian woman out there, if you want to find um, an example, a, a true Christian of great piety, uh, I, I definitely direct you to Sarah Pierpont Edwards. So he wrote, they say there is a young lady in New Haven who is beloved of that almighty being who made and rules the world, and that there are certain seasons in which this great being, in some way or other, invisible, comes to her and fills her mind with exceeding sweet delight, and that she hardly cares for anything except to meditate on him. If you present all the world before her with the richest of, it, rich, with the richest of its treasures, she disregards it and cares not for it, and is unmindful of any pain or affliction. She has a strange sweetness in her mind, and sweetness of temper, uncommon purity in her affections, it is most just and praiseworthy in all her actions, and you could not persuade her to do anything thought wrong or sinful if you would give her all the world, lest she should offend this great being. She is of a wonderful sweetness, calmness, and universal benevolence of mind, especially after those times in which this great God has manifested himself to her mind. She will sometimes go about singing sweetly from place to place, and seems to be always full of joy and pleasure, and no one knows for what. She loves to be alone, and to wander in the fields and on the mountains, and seems to have someone invisible always conversing with her. He was so encouraged with her piety from this age on. She, she was an essential helpmate with, in, with Jonathan Edwards, helping him in his own piety in my opinion, the greatest Christian man in American history. It's largely because of his wife, Sarah Pierpont uh, Edwards. So again, uh, in, in 1729, Solomon died, and he took up the pastor at the age of 26. To summarize his younger years in ministry, John Edwin Smith, who was an American philosopher and Clark professor at, at Yale University and an expert on Edwards in his book, uh, Jonathan Edwards Reader, which I would very much commend to you. I, these are most of the works of Jonathan Edwards, but the, there are many things that are not yet published. He has like 1,200 to 1,400 manuscripts of sermons that are, that are not yet published, and there's reason for that I, can't, I don't have time to get into. However, so he said, by thus meditating between Berkeley on the one hand and Locke, Descartes, and Hobbes on the other, the young Edwards hoped to rescue Christianity from the de dead weight of rationalism and the paralyzing inertia of skepticism. And I don't know if I mentioned that that um, understanding of the human mind was written by John Locke. So th that's one of the people in Hobbes and Berkeley. And again, we don't have time to get into these men. But basically, he's trying to balance these and, and to, to really rescue um, you know, dead weight rationalism and skepticism and so forth. Absolute rationalism, where people thought faith was only rational and didn't see faith in the, in the material world. I'll put it that way. Okay, uh, so now, now I want to get into the Great Awakening and some of this might just, and I mean, I already have some of this planned for next week, or I guess this week, in our next session anyway. For, uh, for our conclusion regarding Jonathan Edwards. So, but I wanted to begin uh, the, the history of the Great Awakening. But first, I wanted to let you know, the first letter we have from Jonathan Edwards was when he was 12 years old to his sister, Mary, which goes thus. Dear Mary, through the wonderful mercy and goodness of God, there hath in this place been a very remarkable stirring and pouring out of the Spirit of God, and likewise now, likewise now is. But I think I have reason to think it is, some, is in some measure diminished, but I hope not much. About 13 have joined the church in a state of fuel com, full communion. I think there comes commonly on Mondays above 30 persons to speak with Father about the condition of their souls. So, at his father's church, there, there was something of a revival. Revivals would be very pivotal to Ed Edwards. And this is one of the things that I somewhat dissent from him regarding, but m that will just have to wait until our next session uh, regarding to Jonathan Edwards. So, now, so earliest on, so the first thing we have from him and the first sentence we have from him is speaking about revivals, okay? And he was pivotal in what's been referred to as now the first Great Awakening. However, in July 
uh, 8th, on July 8th, 1731. So this was two years after he became officially the full-time pastor of that congregational church. He was called to Harvard for the commencement speech. Now, this was a huge deal back in that time. This was like the Super Bowl. All the ministers would come around and certain ministers would preach, you know, during a, an extended period of time. Most of them much older. You know, I mean, this is a time where especially ministers are, are not regarded very well when they're young. And here comes Jonathan Edwards, who had just taken over for Solomon Stoddard. So everybody's expecting him to be like Solomon Stoddard, at least expecting him to be something, you know. So he, he preached the sermon called God Glorified in Man's Dependence. In it, he said, God is glorified in the work of redemption in this that there appears in it so absolute and universal dependence on the, on the redeemed on God. He concluded, let us exalt God alone and ascribe to him all the glory of redemption. Now, during this time, at the same time, the same commencement uh, time. Now, this was the first sermon preached, just so you know. His first sermon preached was this one. Now, alongside of this, unfortunately for Jonathan Edwards, there was an older man, about 85, 86 years old, and I kid you not, his name was William Williams. And the Williams will factor in into our next session. But so Jonathan Edwards' sermon was, you know, published right alongside William Williams' sermon. But it was much different. It was a bit more Arminian in tone, more congregationalist in tone. And we will get into congregationalism in our next session, God willing. But this will come back to kind of hurt Jonathan Edwards. But this time, it's very, it's very big and it's very great and everybody enjoyed it and appreciated it. Again, published it. It was very atypical to, pre to, to publish, you know, a sermon from now a 28-year-old. It was just very atypical. So, in 1734, he preached. So, between these years, he continued preaching on the sovereignty and the glory of God. This is what he focused his ministry on. Salvation is not for the glory of man. Salvation is to the glory of God. All things, all things are to his glory. That doesn't make us nothing. That makes us his children. That makes us his glorified children. So for these three years, He's preaching to the glory of God's great name. In 1734, he preached a sermon entitled A Divine and Supernatural Light. And I just wanted to give you a portion of that where he says, For there is no gift or benefit that is in itself so nearly related to the divine nature. There is nothing the creature receives that is so much of God, of his nature, so much a participation of the deity. It is a kind, it is a kind of emanation of God's beauty and is related to God as the light is to the sun. It is therefore congruous and fit that when it is given of God, it should be nextly from himself and by himself according to his own sovereign will. But this I would very much commend to you. I mean, I have most of his sermons. He, he, you know, he wrote his sermons out for a great period of time. And God willing, well, we're probably not going get to the, get into that. However, this, it, this sparked a great revival in his church and surrounding churches, okay? And he later in 1737, so between 1734 and 1736, there was a great revival in these surrounding areas. And he ended up writing, he first published this, and again, in a newspaper, and then the editor, you know, kind of encouraged him to, well, the editor actually sent it off to, um, Isaac Watts in England, and he encouraged Jonathan Edwards to write a bigger account and we'd publish it, you know, and he did. In 1737, he published his first book, and I'm going to give you the full name, A Faithful Narrative of the Surprising Works of God and the Conversion of Men, Many Hundred Souls in, the, in Northampton and the Neighboring Towns. Okay, so recognize this. The first letter that we have of Jonathan Edwards is about revival, and now his first book is about the... So his first letter was about the revival that was taking place in his father's church. And now he's writing a book. He published a book regarding the revivals that was happening in his own 
church and surrounding areas. And fortunately, that's as far as we're going to be able to get today. Um, I do want to discuss and, and, and get into more detail in our next session regarding this Great Awakening and some of the unfortunate uh, things that happened at his church uh, later on uh, before he died. But I would very much encourage anyone to read of Jonathan Edwards, read his works, read his letters. You know, I, I, my favorite book of his is his treatise on the freedom of the will, because it's more abstract, it's more philosophical, but I love his work on uh, religious affections. This kind of goes into the Great Awakening as well. Um, on the doctrine of original sin is another great one. Um, I mean, I could go on, but I mean, his letters are a great place to start. They're simple enough to read. Freedom of the will is just a bit more difficult because, again, it's abstract, philosophical, and so forth. Um, but his others aren't. And again, I would just very much commend to you the reading of Thomas, uh, Jonathan Edwards. Um, but hopefully, God willing, we will be able to, uh, in 30 minute time, in half an hour time, expand upon this great awakening uh, and, the, and the account of other men who who are very much involved with the Great Awakening, uh, not least of which George Whitfield, George Whitfield, the great evangelist of the time, God willing, we will discuss him and uh, John Wesley and Charles Wesley and go back to Jonathan Edwards as well in our next session. Uh, praise God. Mm -hmm.